All right, I think I've got things up and running. Maybe let me know if you can hear me okay. Make sure it looks good. You can hear everything. Looks like I've got maybe one person on the chat so far. Let me let me check that out here. Make sure we are good to go. Great. Thanks, Brian, for jumping on. We'll see if we get some more folks here. Uh, turn this down. Great. So we got some folks coming in. Sounds like you can hear me okay and you can see everything just fine. So... The technology gods are smiling upon us right now. Uh, quick update here on the weather in Twin Falls. If you're in the west, you're probably in the same boat we're in. We're sort of at halftime of our snowpocalypse. Um, we had a blizzard warning yesterday, so we only got a few inches of snow, maybe three or four inches, but it was very windy. And now it's just cloudy and spitting snow, but we're supposed to get another five to ten inches today and tonight so um but hello no matter where you are out there in the world greetings we'll get started here in a few minutes so feel free to jump on and we'll do some shout outs to all the folks on the chat today thanks for joining me on your saturday if it's saturday where you are it is about 9 52 local time here in the morning so we'll get started in about seven or eight minutes a uh, couple of welcomes to folks. So hello to Brian, uh, Amanda Joe, my great contact. And I guess we're friends now, even though we haven't met in Iceland. She's on here. She's listed as Mandy Joe. So if you have some specific questions about uh, Grindavik or Iceland, she might be able to help in the chat with that. Um, let's see. Where are people from? Sean from the UK. Uh, Joe Perry from North Wales, UK. Dan Cooper's here. Well, sounds like technology is working out great. Cold Snohomish, Washington. Yeah, I think the whole Western U.S. right now. It's it's chilly and supposed to get colder by like Monday or Tuesday. It's supposed to be well below freezing and probably maybe even below zero. Oak Madsen from Denmark. Kat Menku from Lodgepole, Alberta. I would imagine it's cold there. The Zen B from Pittsburgh. Jack Belk, my good friend over in Oakley on Middle Mountain. Gail from Finland. Roger from the UK. Robin from England. Yeah, this is great. So I normally have done this using Zoom and then just open my phone up to read through the chat. But I'm using OBS Studio, which is something I've been using um, for some other things as well, but this is my first time using it as a, on a live stream. And one of the nice features is it has, I have the two monitors set up here and it has uh, a little scroll thing for the, for the live chat. So I can actually see it bigger than if it was on my phone, which is nice. So, um, okay. I'm running behind now on the, on the shout outs. Uh, Sandy Posey from Montana, Dave from Xenia, Ohio. Hopefully I got that right. Daniel from Norway. Robin from England. If I miss someone, I'm sorry. Gail from Finland. Uh, so let's see. I got that one. Teresa from New Mexico. Nunya from Taxachusetts. I don't even I don't know where that is. That's interesting. Um, let's see. John from Shropshire, UK. Steffi from Germany. Alexandra from Hamburg. Lilik from Scotland. Mark from Montana. B. Matt from New Hampshire. Crow Gotho from Sweden. Yeah, we'll do an update here. We'll start with the Iceland update here in a second. Mark from Gardner, Montana. Uh, let's see. Uh, Moonchild from Sweden. So lots of our European friends jumping on. Joe Noswick from Santa Cruz. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Heidi from Nampa, Idaho. Arwen from Lancashire, UK. Negative 34C in Calgary, says Robert. So, yeah, the big chill. The big chill in the Great White North. Uh, Bill in Portland. 
16 degrees in Portland is cold for sure. So it's we're getting a little little taste of Arctic air in the western North America right now. Catherine from Philadelphia. Uh, let's see who else. Jackie from Northern Kentucky. Erica from Cambridge, Ontario. Jinnan from Charlotte. Uh, people shouting out Mandy Joe, very awesome. Uh, Elizabeth, Liz from Ontario, Una from Ireland. Oh boy, I won't get to all of these, but we'll do a couple more. Arla, Houston, Dale from Sweden. Oh, it just jumped ahead, so now I might have missed a few. I apologize if I'm missing your name, I, I super apologize. D from Ontario, Kate from Cambridgeshire, England. Eager from Nepal, that's pretty cool. Um, Pamela from the cold gray coast of south coast of the UK. Mike from Oceanside. Sheila from Buffalo. John Jackson from New Zealand. Uh, Espli from Slovakia. Dennis from Dorset. Oh, it just jumped ahead again. So we'll have to see how if we like using this as much. Um, yeah, you guys can see where people are from. I mean, but it's fun to hear the shout outs, right? Super fun. Yeah, we'll start here in about four minutes on my watch. Thanks for joining me and spending part of your day with us here. Uh, let's see. Rap from Wyoming. Paul James from Cloudy Hampshire, New England. Judy from Kent Island, Maryland. Terry Brown from Waverly, Tennessee. Very cool. Um, Diedrich from Friesland, Netherlands. Vin from New York. Uh, Adam from Berlin, Cato from Amsterdam, Vanessa from Lithuania, Ellen from Germany. It's cool that I picked up so many people in Europe. Um, I'm assuming a lot of folks have joined me with all the Iceland updates I've been doing. So that's great, even though I'm a U.S.-based geologist and a lot of the videos tend to be U.S.-based. I mean, the great thing is that no matter what I'm showing you um, or whatever story I'm trying or story I'm trying to convey, rocks are rocks right it doesn't matter necessarily where you're from a lot of the things i might be showing you in you know in southern idaho or california like you can see something similar the concepts are the same geology is the same no matter where you are so that's that's a great takeaway i suppose um yeah carolyn from uk anna marie from parkersburg west virginia gary from boise Mark Simons from his truck somewhere in Texas. Patricia from Hull, Massachusetts. Yeah, so what we'll do today, just as a little bit of an overview, is we'll do an update on Iceland. I've got some information to share with you. Um, hasn't erupted yet, so if you're waiting to, there, there's the punchline. Um, provide a little bit of information about some field trips I'm gonna do in April and beyond. And then maybe talk a little bit about some upcoming videos and ideas in the hopper or ideas you might have. And then we can wrap it up with some Q&A. So we'll go as, we'll go as long as we need to. Um, I'm good for an hour and a half if, if folks want to hang with me and, and do it that long. Um, lots of geology folks here. Astro Dave from Colorado Springs. Debbie from Baltimore. Joaquin from Chile. Jamie from the UK. Doug from Bogota, Colombia. Wow, we've really got like quite the quite the diversity here. I love it. It's so fun. Um, thank you, technology in 2024. Jan from Denver. Elizabeth from Akureyri. I think that's how you say it. It's the north. It's one of the cities in the north of I Iceland. Uh, Mark from Leamington, UK. And it does let me scroll back a little bit. So. Yeah, fun stuff. Let's see. Sab from Canada. Awesome. This is just so fun. You know, if you've never live streamed before, it's a bit of a surreal, weird experience because all you have to visually tell you that there's anyone else that you're talking to is the the chat, right? And the little number of people there on the live chat so we've got 700 right now which is incredible otherwise you're in your office like talking to yourself um, which feels a little odd but kind of used to it now and doing all the videos and such again thanks for joining me 
we'll go ahead and get started here in a couple minutes also be sure to hit the like button all those things help the algorithm and help broadcast this to more people um, I'm just big into geology education so getting this out and any good geology content out to as many people as possible is is what I'm passionate about uh, let's see a couple more folks then we'll get started I got like one maybe one more minute on my clock here Brian from Scotland Jim from Oklahoma uh, Barbara from Idaho Susan from Dayton Ohio pudding from Orkfordshire UK turnips from the land of Louisiana nice that must be Scotland I've seen that before uh, VG from New South Wales Australia down under sloth outdoors from Cotswold UK awesome tremendous well thanks again for joining me it is 10 o'clock on my watch well 10 o'clock on my watch 9 59 on my computer but uh, lots of nervous energy so I'm just gonna go ahead and start it so thank you again for joining me I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey welcome to this live stream in this YouTube channel it is January 13th here in the Mountain West of North America, about 10 a.m. local time, 5 p.m. UTC or in Iceland. What we'll do today with the live stream is we'll do an update on the situation there, go through the data, possibly look at some of the news, um, maybe also discuss some things going on there. I've got a few analogies that I hope will help maybe help you visualize some of the processes that are going on there. And then I have a few just real quick updates on some field trips I've got planned for folks like you, YouTube viewers, in April. Uh, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about ones further in the summer, even though I don't have hard dates for those yet. We'll discuss some upcoming ideas I have for some videos, some ones I know that will be coming to you soon that are all queued up and mostly ready to go. And then we'll end with some Q&A. So if you have questions for me and you put those in the chat, make sure they're in all caps or you put at and then my name so that it kind of pops up as something being more, um, you know, it pops up as an actual visual there. So hold on, I just got a text from Amanda Jo. She says, good end of it closed for three weeks. Amanda Jo, if you could just give me a little bit more information on on that. It just sounds like they're closing the town for three weeks with the all the uncertainty if you could give me a little bit more information on that and I'll share that here in a minute just through our little uh, thread that we text each other on so okay so let's just jump right to it here team and let's start with the uh, start with the earthquakes like we often do I like starting with the earthquakes because they're more often than not a good telltale sign of of what the magma is doing perhaps or where it might erupt or as we get closer to eruption, it often shows us what's going on. So this is, again, the last 24 hours looking at our, our data, very similar to what we've looked at the last few updates. Let me get a proper zoom in there. Sorry about that. And so you can see, again, the trend from southwest to northeast right along that magma intrusion. Last update, I drew you a little diagram, a cartoon sketch, if you will, of possibly what's going on. So remember, a good way to think about dikes and sills um, is that sills are typically oriented horizontally parallel to the rock layers and sills are for storage so sills are basically magma storage bodies and then dikes which tend to move not necessarily vertically they might move at an angle but they're going to typically cut across the rock layers typically headed for the surface dikes are for transport so sills are for storage of magma and dikes are for transporting that magma to possibly some shallower level, possibly to the surface at a vent. Um, but that's maybe a way to differentiate those two. And so I, I drew a sketch of maybe what it looks like in the subsurface. It's undoubtedly flawed and wrong, but at least maybe helps us match what we're seeing in the surface data as we look at this earthquake data and the GPS data, and then helps us build a conceptual model in that that other dimension looking down uh, and, and even recognize too that those sketches I put together those are still two-dimensional drawings right I'm looking I'm ignoring the north-south component and just fixating on the depth and the east-west when I draw a cross-section that's east-west um, if I was a better artist maybe I could draw try to draw something in three dimensions but a little bit tricky so our earthquakes have been relatively small uh, all below twos looks like we've had a couple above magnitude one 
Uh, but the number of earthquakes in terms of frequency and the size, at least to me right now, doesn't seem to point to anything happening in the very short term. These are all right at that depth. We kind of expect them to be around four kilometers, four to five kilometers. Um, not seeing a whole lot of shallower quakes like we might see. There is one there that's a little bit shallower, but we'd want to see several of these, right? So we'd want to see more shallow quakes if that magma was making its way up to the surface. And we know that it could get to the surface quickly and possibly without a lot of seismic activity because it's already established this pathway. We've already developed this, this plumbing system, this pathway for the magma to rise up to the surface. So there's our earthquake data just sort of spatially. Here's the Met Office earthquake data over the last 48 hours. Uh, and the weather's been a probably stable enough that we're probably capturing most, if not all, of the earthquakes in that region. So you can see the frequency on the plot here going from uh, the evening or late afternoon Thursday through Friday uh, and into today. And so the, the color of the dot just indicates how recent it is. Last four hours in red, four to 12 hours in orange yellow, blue as it gets older. And then we can see the magnitude here on the y-axis. So there's that one that was above magnitude two, and then we've got much smaller quakes. So a small clustering in here, um, but doesn't seem to incre be increasing in frequency. Um, nothing I'm seeing there that's alarming or possibly worth monitoring. We're just sort of at the same level we've been at. And this could go on. I mean, we've been playing this game now for several weeks, I suppose maybe three weeks or so since the December 18th to 21st eruption. Um, how long will this go on? Maybe some folks have tapped out of the Iceland monitoring game because you know you, you want something quick and, and easy. That's kind of the way we live in this world. But we're on a geologic time scale here and this magma could stay underground and, and slowly fill that sill. Um, but at some point we expect something to happen. We still have evidence that the magma is intruding into a shallow level and that's just not sustainable over the long term into like months or years. And so something's got to give either the magma influx needs to decrease or stall. Uh, we need to get an eruption or we need that magma to move into some other region in the subsurface. And we should see indicators that any one of those three things is happening as we go forward in time. Uh, looking at the GPS data, so remember this site, and I'll make sure I put links to these on uh, on the video description. So here's our, our map and lots of different GPS stations we, we could look at. The most interesting one that's been the focus is this SENG one. This is right above or near the Svartsengi power plant. That's the one that's shown the most uplift, so we believe it's most centrally located to the middle of the sill or the magma body, but other ones in the region are also showing uplift and movement that are worth looking at. So let's start with that one there, and we'll just go right to the uplift plot. Uh, I've explained these before, but quickly, uh, if you're new, the red dots just show the elevation of this specific GPS station over time. So you can see the months of the year at the bottom. And then we have uplift here on the y-axis in millimeters, a little bit of error bars on each one. And so here's the elevation in mid-October, nothing was happening. And then as this ramped up, that was a sign that magma was intruding into the shallow parts of the crust, causing the land to rise a few tens of millimeters above it. That um, reached a breaking point around November 10th when the magma that was inflating in this region, some of that magma moved to the east and started to form that northwest, or excuse me, northeast, southwest trending dike that we see where all the earthquakes are happening. Those, um, the GPS measurements since that time have been moving upwards. So we've seen a lot of upward movement since that point. And then that culminated with the December 18th eruption which was fairly small in the grand scheme of things. And that moved uh, the GPS station down a little bit because some of that volume had been moved from the subsurface onto the surface. And then since December 18th, we've been watching patiently and slowly um, as we've been watching this creep up. And now we've passed, we're well past the thresholds we saw on November 10th and December 18th. 
and we're creeping upwards. They're going to have to change the axis of the graph pretty soon because the red dots are getting close to the top. They're going to need to bump that up a little bit. So the real question, of course, is like how how much how far can this go? How much more magma can intrude into the subsurface without an eruption? And we just don't know the answer to that right now. Um, clearly, it can, it it has taken more um, magma in terms of volume than it did prior to December 18th. But things have changed since then. You've got maybe more space in the subsurface. You've got more heat in the subsurface that's allowing the crust to behave more elastically and bend rather than break. Um, and so this is where we're at right now. So the trend is still upwards. I'd say the overall slope of the line, even though there's been little kind of, it's been ebbing and flowing a little bit, I'd say it's still pretty much the same as it's been. Uh, if we look at another station to the west, the Elvorp station, this one shows a similar pattern. But look how much higher it got uh, around November 10th, upwards of about 120 millimeters of movement above the zero mark here. Then it came crashing down uh, to this point, almost 240 millimeters, started moving back up in November into December. Then there was the eruption, which dropped it back down and now it's ramping back up again and it's just barely getting to and possibly just slightly exceeding those pre-December 18th values there. And this is what we typically see if you look at the Krafa eruptions in the north part of Iceland in the late 70s. It, I think it was seven or eight, maybe nine years of this kind of pattern of behavior where we would have magma inflation. Um, sometimes it would result in an eruption and things would drop. Sometimes it would just erupt or excuse me, inflate and intrude magma without erupting. Uh, for a period of time and it's this sort of just sawtooth stair step pattern that went on for years and we might be looking at that in the long term over the next few years maybe decades one more station to the north uh, let me orient you here so we just looked first we looked at the Seng station then we looked over here at the Elvorp station now we're going to look at one to the north here the NR NORV station and this one wasn't put online until after the November 10th event apparently but you can see the rise post November 10th um, the eruption on December 18th is the next little uh, hiccup in the data there and then look at that nice steep rise since that point and here's another graph they're going to need to they're going to need to change the axis a little bit to get it all in there so where does it end who knows um, difficult to say there's just so much so many variables in the subsurface we don't know in terms of storage capacity of the magma the actual gas content of the magma the pressure that the magma is putting on the surrounding rocks we don't know much about the surrounding rocks at these depths you know down a few kilometers in the subsurface are these stacked lava flows with uh, high amounts of porosity and permeability between them fractures gas bubbles is it maybe instead of lava flows maybe at this level uh, four or five kilometers below the power plant, maybe we're looking at intrusive rocks. So these are older magma bodies that intruded, cooled and solidified. So therefore they're much more dense. Um, all good, good questions. And all of these are variables that we just don't have a strong handle on right now. So, so there's our GPS data uh, for now. And let's go to the Met office and see what they have. So this was their update from yesterday. Um, the brief one, the main thing they did yesterday with their their update was put out a new hazard map. They try to do that, I think, around once a week or so, in, or unless something changes, then they'll do it more often. So they put out a new hazard map. I'll show you that here in a second. Um, the overall risk assessment is unchanged from the last map. So they're still, just like we are, expecting an eruption at any point, um, but not knowing exactly time-wise when that might occur. The risk associated with the sudden opening of cracks that have been mapped within Grindavik has been estimated to be higher. Uh, and we'll talk more about the gentleman, that the, the tragedy that unfolded where a, a worker uh, fell into one of those cracks here in a minute. Um, it should be noted that the risk associated with cracks is limited to known and defined areas within the town limits. So not much there. And here's the 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 updated map and again the only real thing here that's probably of interest would be there we go getting it all in there is i think they just added um 
cracks and some some of the some of the language they used for some of the hazards uh, in and around Gudindavik. But for the most part, it's largely unchanged. You can see the December 18th to 21st flow field here in gray. Uh, you can see the power plant in Blue Lagoon right here in the middle of the map, and then the towns here on the south end. And so these are just different hazard zones by color, and then they list the hazards in terms of what is most likely to be happening there. Like, is it going to be an earthquake? We're we looking at gas emissions, actually lava. What are the known or expected hazards in each one of these zones? Um, okay, so that's the Met Office update. The other update they did put out yesterday um, involves, let me make this a little bit bigger. We did, in our last update, we talked about there was a big earthquake, not a big earthquake, but a moderate sized earthquake uh, to the east at Grimsvoten, the big, the bigger volcano that sits underneath the ice cap in central Iceland. And that earthquake seems to have been the ice shifting. Uh, so let me actually just take you right to a diagram that I, I found that I think will be uh, super helpful. So let's go to this and switcheroo here. So what I've got here is a couple things. Um, let's start with the diagram, then I'll, I'll explain what the photo is. And this is from a great book I have. It's actually a huge. So if you really want to deep dive into this stuff, here's your here's your homework. The Encyclopedia of Volcanoes. There's the thickness of this book. Um, it is 1,400 plus pages long, but there's a little bit of something on everything in here. And so I dove into that book yesterday as I was trying to understand or figure out a way to show this a little bit better. And I came across this diagram, which is really helpful. So the idea here is we have at Grimsvot that we have this feeder dike, right? So we have the plumbing system, the conduit that carries magma to the surface. But then when it gets to the surface, instead of erupting into the air, it's covered in all this ice because it's beneath the glacier. And so the activity of the volcano beneath the glacier melts some of the ice and that creates a collapse feature above the mag above the the vent that they call an ice cauldron and so this is what it would look like here at the surface um, just a collapsed pit of ice you can see these crevasses more or less circular or maybe kind of oval in terms of its shape um, and that's because it's right above the area where the glacier is losing mass or losing ice because of the heat from the uh, vent below and so it might be piling up volcanic material at the bottom uh, could be pillow lavas probably in the initial stages and this kind of feeds into another video I did on what these landforms can look like when the ice is gone they're called tuyas but the idea here is that you've got meltwater so we've got liquid water at the base of the glacier and sometimes the weight of the glacier can ca cap that off a little bit but is that as we build up pressure here um, from this volcanic activity that can cause the ice to shift and then it can release a lot of this meltwater out the base of the glacier and that get, all gets that surge of water is then a big glacial outburst flood or what they call in Icelandic a Jokoklop something like that um, and so that's what we experienced couple days ago with this volcano in central Iceland. Um, let me go back now to the Met office. So hopefully this diagram helps a little bit, giving you a little cross section, showing the ice, where the, the vent would be, and then the meltwater coming out uh, from the bottom of that. So, uh, and they've got a nice little map here. So there's the actual volcano, and then the path that the water took underneath the glacier, and then out to the margin of the glacier, and then out here along the coast and then out towards the sea here underneath this this uh this road here the ring road highway one okay so so hopefully that explains that a little bit and so what they're saying here is that they did experience a rise in the water level of about 70 centimeters over a couple of days uh, the electric conductivity in the river has also started to rise slightly. So as it's releasing more water, it's picking up more sediment. It becomes more turbid and more murky. Um, and so you can actually measure that with electric conductivity because you have more particles in it than just pure water. Um, 
And sometimes, and the reason they really were keeping an eye on this is sometimes in the past, not always, but there's been times when these glacial flooding events could trigger an eruption because by um, reducing some of the pressure on the volcano and, and some of the load on it, that's been known to trigger eruptions in the past a little bit. So, so I just wanted to do a little follow-up there, especially with the, with the diagram. So hopefully, hopefully that was helpful. Okay, so let's go to some of the news. Um, and actually, before we get to the news, let me use my, my little analogy I brought in here. And so in thinking about the magma and the lava beneath um, Grindavik in this area, I'll just leave this graphic up for now. What I brought in here is a, a little sponge. And I wanted to find a better sponge in our department, but it's the best I could do. Maybe something they used to clean the glassware in the chem lab. But you can see a sponge is made out of lots of little holes, right? So think of a sponge sponge as a <clears throat> network of pore spaces, but the structure, the sponge itself, um, in this case the yellow material, is just it's interconnected, right? All those pore spaces are interconnected through the sponge. You can think of magma a lot like a sponge. When, and, and the yellow part of the sponge, the solid part, would be the crystals. So as the crystals grow, as magma cools, the crystal networks grow, become more interlocking. If it completely uh, interlocks, it will cool and solidify completely. You know, get a rock like a granite or something like that. But let's go back to the sponge. Let's just say we have a partially cooled magma body. And so just like this sponge, if I go take this and put it under the sink and allow water to uh, penetrate the sponge, that water will go into the interstitial spaces, all these pore spaces in the sponge, and it will be interconnected, right? And I can still squeeze the sponge and water can come out. Think of this kind of like magma. Now, this is maybe a silly analogy, but I was hoping this would be helpful. The crystals are the sponge and the magma, the liquid melted part, is the water, right? It's in the, it's in the interstitial spaces, right? And so it's a good way to maybe think about the way magma behaves and how it crystallizes more. I was reading some of these other papers in the big book there, um, and that, I don't know, kind of made me think about explaining that a little bit better. That when we, if we have an influx of new fresh magma into the system, that will break apart those crystals. It will separate them. Some of those crystals might get melted and, and incorporated back into the melt or the actual magma itself. Um, and if you can increase the amount of melt, you can make magma more eruptible. So you need to have less than 50% crystals in order to get the magma to erupt. And it could be, you know, at least over there in the dike off to the northeast, um, east of the power plant, that the magma is just a little too crystallized right now. And we've got to build up not just pressure, but put more fresh magma into the system, have that fresh magma propagate into those dikes which probably weren't that wide they were probably only a few meters wide um when they when those erupted and that might be enough then to, to trigger the eruption so hopefully that analogy helps a little bit um okay let's see what have i got next so uh let's go to some news items here uh and let me give you a quick update because amanda joe just sent me some stuff so uh, she sent me a news article which i probably don't have time to read live but she says the town will be open until seven o'clock monday evening but uh, and then she mentioned someone's name probably the mayor or someone reiterates that there's a great danger around the cracks in the town and people need to be very careful i believe this is to let those living there again let those living there again and those with every anything left in town over the last weeks to get their things and make other arrangements so they're letting people into town um, but they're looks like they're restricting the access a little bit. And again, this is this is so, so hard to deal with because you got a town with a risk. If you shut it down completely, now that you're disrupting people's livelihood, we've seen that this has gone on now for, now we're into two months with this episode, or a little bit more than that actually. Um, and it could go on for months longer. And at the same time, you're trying to manage public safety and make sure Think everyone's safe and okay and it, it's such a sticky wicket it's so difficult to uh to deal with all that um uh okay so let's see here so the 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 sad news here is we had the worker that fell into this crack and fracture system in Grindavik, and they've decided actually to call off the search 
mainly because the conditions and the safety they were concerned about the safety for the rescuers so they've got to get down this big hole in the ground and look for this person um but it's very treacherous and so you know given the safety concerns they've actually decided to call it off and they haven't been able it says they found no further traces of the man so um unfortunately he's he's probably no longer with us but that's just so, sort of the reality is you don't want someone else to get hurt uh, at the same time and this was a nice little graphic that was shared here that actually shows this big fracture or crack in town and i i got some translation done by some folks uh amanda joe helped me out with this so you don't have to read it in icelandic so it's you know titled what we know about the crack uh, the search for the man that fell down a crack at a private resident in Gudindavik. The crack is measured to be over 30 meters deep. So it's over 100 feet deep. That's pretty incredible. And so you can see the opening of the crack is narrow, but it widens further down. So that would make getting into that somewhat difficult. Um, you've got a narrow passageway and you're trying to get probably equipment and personnel through that. And then it's about 20 meters, a little over 60 feet down to the water level. And then the water is another 13 to 14 meters deep. And so you can see how difficult that would be to operate in a in a high angle rescue situation like that with a vertical, uh, more or less plumb fracture. The rocks on the walls, like, I mean, I've as a rock climber and someone who's done a lot of rappelling, I to tell you right now that some of the rock here is probably unstable. Does the rope rub on a rock and cause something to dislodge and then it falls down? Um, probably pretty, pretty nasty. Um, I don't know if this is because underneath Gudindavik at this depth, you'd expect to possibly be getting some seawater in there. So I don't know if this is fresh groundwater or seawater or maybe some brackish mixture. But I thought I'd share this graphic with you just so you could see uh, some of the difficulties they're facing there. So it's incredibly deep crack, incredibly difficult conditions. And the poor rescuers have been working for, I think, a solid two days now on this and, and like he says here it's 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 also possible to continue indefinitely but at some point it just became too dangerous for the for the crew uh, and that's ultimately they've just called that off so um and maybe i don't know maybe they'll they'll reconsider that at some point but that's kind of the way it stands now so so our um our heart our hearts go out to the not just the rescuers but the family of the individual uh, amanda joe tells me that the man's name the individual who fell down the crack they've the family's asked that they not blast his name out on media and so um, that's the reason why we're not seeing a lot of that right now so um, hopefully i got all that right so thanks again to uh, amanda joe for her updates on that um, i believe that's all i have for the iceland news so let me give you a quick a uh, little announcement on some field trips and then we'll get right to the the q a and so if you're new to my channel last year in october i did a couple of field trips here in southern idaho for youtube viewers uh, they went well it was an amazing group of people we looked at rocks all day we explored we discussed and it was just incredibly edifying and, and fun the whole day. So I've decided to do another round of those. So this trip here on the April 12th and 13th will be the same trip as the one I did in October, but it will obviously allow a different group of people to come if they choose to and do that. So it'll be about, um, you know, I'd like to cap it at about 30 or so people. And it ran pretty smoothly last time. We just met at a central location here in Twin Falls each day at a certain time. We rallied together. I provided a brief overview and then we carpooled as a group to some different spots along the way. We took a break for lunch at like a little park uh, with a pavilion, um, did lots of cool regional geology. And then we ended up back at the meeting place, you know, later in the day. And then everyone kind of went their separate ways. So some everyone would be on their own to, you know, you can camp, you can stay in a hotel, you can rent a a house if you want to whatever you want to do so if you're interested in this just shoot me an email the idea would be that on that first day uh we'll be locally here around twin falls looking at the snake river canyon there's a tremendous evidence of the bonneville flood there's two different styles of volcanic activity recorded in the rocks there's shoshone falls which is a big um huge waterfall it's called the niagara of the west 
Um, might be, and in April, it could be really spectacular depending on the snow and the runoff and that sort of thing. Uh, and then the next day on the 13th, we'll head to the west, just about half an hour west of Twin Falls, uh, places like Box Canyon, Thousand Springs, Malad Gorge, the Hagerman Fossil Beds area. Um, so if you're interested in those, shoot me an email um, and we'll get like a sign up list going. Uh, there is a little bit of a suggested donation if, if you can if you can do that great if not um, you know I'd understand and then I'll do some other trips in June probably like craters of the moon uh, and some other parts of the the region here in southern Idaho eventually I might you know expand to other areas but right now it makes sense for me just to kind of keep it simple and stay local. Uh, until it feels like no more people want to come to southern Idaho and then we'll we'll think about going someplace else so um, yeah and I do have a trip the trip to Iceland um, is full that's for May I have a trip in 2025 on the Grand to the Grand Canyon on a river trip that one is full right now but I'll probably repeat a lot of these trips so if there's just a trip you're interested in just keep paying attention let me know also looking to do a big island of Hawaii trip uh, in 2025 next summer um, so just let me know if you're interested in those and I'll try to keep you apprised of things as they develop so okay public service announcement over um, Q&A session awesome so let's get right to it and let me pull up Google Earth that might be handy because a lot of times we use this and let's see how this is going to go here. Um, so I'm using OBS for the first time. So I'm going to scroll way back as far, as far as I can and try to pick out some questions. So remember, if you have questions, use at and my name or put it in all caps. Um, let's see. Yeah, I don't know if this... I don't know if this OBS goes all the way back. So Susan wants to know, do geothermal plants have any effect on the local geology? Um, to my knowledge, not really. The geothermal power plants are just tapping fairly shallow heated groundwater. Um, so in the case of Iceland, there's no evidence to suggest that the activity of the power plant tapping that naturally hot water in the shallow subsurface has any bearing on what's happening in the deeper levels with the the magma system at all um so not really but maybe maybe there's an angle we could consider there that's that where it would but susan my immediate response is a no so um and i hope obs is taking me to the top of the thing so if if it looks like I skipped yours, you might want to. If you if it's been a while since you posed your question, consider reposting it. Uh, from Ruth Davies, please would you explain why the magma is moving under the crust? It's ebb and flow, etc. I've heard that it's due to the convection currents caused by the core of the Earth. Is this true? Okay, so well, that's a there's a lot there, Ruth, to unpack. Um, so the outer core of the Earth is behaves like a liquid so we believe it's mostly molten material we could call that magma there are some places like hot spots where there's some debate and question as to whether or not those hot spots tap that magma body in the outer core a lot of people think that the hot spots like iceland or hawaii are actually excuse me actually tapping magma further above the outer core in the mantle um, and so it's the mantle that is the source for a lot of that magma. Um, but why does it ebb and flow under the crust? Yeah, it could be it could be convection currents. We think the convection currents in the outer core is what drives plate tectonics to some degree. Just the the heating heat rising and then cooler material sinking. Just just like when you heat up a pot of water on your stove, that water at the bottom. In contact with the heat that hot water rises as it rises it cools it expands and then it sinks back down um, so I guess the answer to your question is yes in, in a broad sense if I'm, if I'm reading your question right so hopefully that I did a good job there um, okay Scott Scotty from the Isle of Man are the large number of fissures in Grindavik due to its natural geology or solely pressure from the magma quakes, etc. So I think there's a couple things he mentions there. There are the 
let's get this up here to just for reference um are the large number of fishers in so when when i read that scotty i think of two things i think of uh the fractures that were already there prior to november 10th and then i think of the most recent ones like what they're dealing with in town and i don't know exactly which one you're referring to there but let's address both perhaps um yeah so we have this obvious north east southwest trend let's get rid of that real quick uh, in the landscape in Iceland, right? The plate boundary and the tectonics um, has a strong influence on the top topography, on the landforms we see. So we have the uh, the Krishuvik system over here, this volcanic system. A lot of these hills and ridges here are subglacial volcanoes. Uh, but even closer to uh, Grindavik, if we just look at this older crater row, we can see that strong trend as well and in some places that is manifested as volcanic craters so we have this this fissure eruption this alignment of volcanic craters and in other places if we come down here to the town and look even just like right here you can see these big cracks running through town um, that were there that have been there for presumably you know hundreds of years but then we have other places where there's just fractures, right? And if you go all over the Reykjanes Peninsula, you'll see that's pretty common. Places where there's just big fractures, but no eruptive products, right? So these are non-eruptive fissures. These are just cracks. And so these are fractures or cracks related to the extension, the pulling apart uh, of this part of Iceland. Because it's not just a hot spot, it's a divergent plate boundary. And so the the land itself is literally being ripped apart in an east-west direction um, and so yeah so the large number of fissures is due to both volcanic processes and the tectonics of the area the faults the fractures the 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 stress that the area is under so hopefully that was a good enough answer for that one there uh let's see what else we've got here um yeah, and thank you all for joining me. This is great. Does the higher rise from Dave F, does the higher rise mean a greater eruption? So I think he's referring to, if we go back to the, the GPS data, I believe that's what he's referring to. Not necessarily. So he's asking, hey, like if, it, if this, when we got to this level on December 18th, we had an eruption of, you know, such a volume of, of lava well, now that we're past that point, does that mean the eruption is going to be greater? And greater, I suppose he means greater in terms of volume, not explosivity or how grand it looks. Um, not necessarily. It depends on how much gas is dissolved in that magma system. So the concentration of the gases in the magma is going to dictate to some degree how much of it erupts. Depends too, as we talked about the little sponge and the crystals, how much of that magma is crystals versus melt. Because if we can swing that one way versus another, that might mean more magma gets erupted or lava gets erupted versus some other amount. Um, so I guess the, the the short answer to your question, Dave, is not necessarily. Just because we've the ground has risen higher than it did prior to these two points here, that does not mean we're going to have necessarily a larger volume eruption. So good stuff. Um, okay, let's see what else. And I might be I might be way back in the chat, so I, there's no way. It'd be nice if they put timestamps on everyone's little comment, and then I would know um, when when those comments were made. But that's okay. Um, from a proud liberal, shouldn't the y-axis on the graphs generated by the University of Iceland all have the same scale, so not to visually distort the magnitude of the various measurements? So what they're referring to is when you look at the the y-axis, the up and down amounts here, uh, they're they're sometimes different. So this one you can see the spacings, you know, every you know 50, 100, 150, 200, and then you come over to a different one, and it's different. All I can say is I think the size of the graph is always the same. And so they're trying to show as much of the movement as possible. So they they change. And maybe it's an automated thing that the computer does. They're changing the values here to reflect that. So it does make it a little bit messy. And I mentioned on a previous update, you got to watch that a little bit um, to make sure that you're not distorting or misinterpreting things. Um, 
Okay, Carrie, how many convection cells locally or one big one handle magma now like liquid? Um, good question. There's well, the 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 easy answer is we don't know. <laughs> that's you know so many things we don't know. I mean, we're looking at something that's thousands of kilometers down. Um, the simplistic way is to envision these big convective cells. That's probably the simple way that we often present plate tectonics and you know convection in the earth but it's probably not accurate there's probably smaller ones um and and more of them which makes it messy really good question uh i don't have a lot of insights into that so um let's see questions questions yeah and thanks for everyone for for i i will go through and read them all later but right now in, in the moment it's hard to read through everything um, Marsha wants to know, would there be flooding concerns with this? I'm assuming she's talking about these glacial outburst floods. Um, not really. So these areas in Iceland where this occurs, thankfully, um, and you can see them out here. So if we like zoom way out, um, here's Vatnajökull, the biggest glacier in Europe and the biggest one in Iceland. And this is the product of those glacial outburst floods. You can see this big black plain um, if you've ever driven this in Iceland, it's, you know, a lot of Iceland's driving is geologically fantastic and captivating. Every view, there's a waterfall and a mountain range, and there's something awesome to see. There's portions of this drive that, at least for Iceland standards, I suppose, are, are kind of boring <laughs> um, with not a whole lot to see. Uh, let's see if we can get a, no, that's not helpful. I was trying to give you a street view, but let's see if we can. We got to find a place in here where there's, uh, let's pick one of these dots here, just so you get an idea if you haven't been to Iceland. Um, so these big, vast, flat, there you go. I mean, that's what it looks like, right? You can see the mountains and the glaciers in the distance. Um, if, you're, if, if you're lucky enough, sometimes you can see the sea at the other end, but it's kind of this monotonous black, landscape usually not a lot of vegetation because there's frequent enough glacial outburst floods coming through this region that it, it makes the difficult for the the uh, vegetation to grow but this is sort of the landscape we're talking about um and so the flooding concerns they now in the past they have had bridges wash out so two things one not a lot of people living here so the flooding concerns from a human habitation standpoint are minor to zero um, but not a lot of infrastructure either. There's just this road and they've actually, uh, done their due diligence and built some really, uh, robust and strong bridges that can withstand, um, you know, even the biggest ones, you know, even the biggest floods. So, so there's a great view of the, the highlands and the glaciers in the background. That's where the meltwater and these outburst floods are coming from. And then the Sandur, this big flat plain extending out uh, in all directions so yeah so not too concerned with that in terms of flooding i mean it is a flood but it's not a flood with hazards with actual impact to uh, society for the most part um carolyn wants to know why is Grindavik not in the red zone now so she's probably referring to the hazard map um well it's a good question <laughs> i mean um The area in red is the area that we're most likely to see an active vent open. So the area in red, the way I understand this, if we, if, if and when we have an eruption, it's most likely to be in these two red um, kind of rectangles here. So Gdynjavik, while although it has risk of lava flows coming into it, it doesn't have the risk of actually lava erupting from the ground. It doesn't have the risk of high concentrations of gas, spatter. And so I'm imagining that's why they put it in orange. When you look at it from a human point of view, well, yeah, it, then the whole town should be in red because that's where all the people are. And maybe the power plant in Blue Lagoon should be in red. But when you, but what they've done here, I believe, and I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds and in interpreting it this way, is they've, they're looking at the, the hazardous regions on the ground and then applying those risk or hazard zones on the map in that manner so they're not looking necessarily at they are i mean they're just looking at what the hazards are so earth, earthquakes um gases lava 
maybe ash and and they're mapping accordingly so but yeah solid question for sure um okay other questions here and of course i probably won't be able to get to all of these so i apologize um scrolling scrolling let's see yeah and there's probably i'm sure there's people on this chat that know as much or more than i do on some of these topics so i appreciate you when you have good expertise sharing uh with others uh brian wants to know sean any views to do any geology etc in scotland oh my gosh scotland's awesome i've been to scotland once um going to scotland as a geologist is like it's a bit of a pilgrimage because so much of our understanding of earth processes came from scottish geologists and people in the region and so going to a place like sicker point which has this fantastic angular unconformity where james hutton voila had an epiphany and, and realized that the earth was much older than the, the traditional view at the time and that rocks had to be laid down that took a while they had to be tilted that took a while then they had to be eroded and other rocks laid down on top um yeah i'd like to go back to scotland but i don't have any plans uh in the next year or two so um okay let's see what else we have here okay i think okay looking at it now i can see that on obs that i was not very far back on the chat so let me switch over to my my phone here and see if i can pick out some some more questions okay debbie appleby i see there's a massive amount of gas venting seen on the Seelingerfeld webcam this morning is it lots of gas colder than usual okay i know exactly what she's talking about um so if we go to uh let's see here let's pull up th this webcam she's talking about because that will make it a little more impactful um so if you look at let me find that webcam uh well i'll just pull up this one and hope hope this one works well enough um okay so here we go so i don't know which webcam in particular she's looking at but th this is the idea basically if you look at the lava field that formed on december 18th to 21st 2021 if you look at the webcam over the last couple days when it's clear when it has been cloudy you'll see that there's a lot of steam rising off of that or just you know water vapor is probably the right word rising off of that lava field and that's because they've had so much rain so by the lava field still hot and so depending on the atmospheric conditions at the time in terms of temperature humidity and recent rainfall that can all affect how much water vapor or steaming it looks like it's producing so it has nothing to do with um, the actual lava field becoming more active or something like that it's just that they've got so much more water on it that more water is evaporating and so you're seeing that there so thanks for that question um question from rap if the Svart singy gps station is showing the most uplift why would the blue lagoon be allowed to operate it doesn't make any sense at all Oh boy. Um, and this is where I get a little bit uncomfortable because I'm fine dealing with the geology part, but when it comes to, you know, public officials and, you know, making those decisions, it's tricky. So, so he's absolutely, they're absolutely right that, you know, you've got the, the maximum uplift is right over where, uh, the power plant is. And so, um, in the blue lagoon area, more or less. And let me add real quick here just some of my other little fun uh, things here so we can um, ch -ch 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 -ch. what else do we want to add here here's the oh we don't want to put that on um, yeah that's probably good enough for now I'll have to I don't know where my little berm went but anyway um, I mean, they're obviously trying to run a business and they're talking with the government agencies and public officials to try to operate. Maybe they've put enough protocols and procedures into place that they feel good about it. It really comes down to acceptable risk, right? Is there a risk here? Absolutely. Um, is that risk high enough to necessitate closing the Blue Lagoon down? Some would argue yes and some would argue no. Um, you could also just say, hey, like we, 
we haven't had anything happen for a month now like can't we run our business and don't you think there'll be time we're probably not going to have it erupt right in the blue lagoon and we've got this berm now built up around it so if lava is pouring in towards it we have you know we have some time to get out and so yeah that would be a good question to you know pose to someone else but there you go that's my two cents on it from Heidi is it easier for magma to remelt magma that has cooled from the previous eruption yes because that's already hotter so this fresh magma that's coming into the system is encountering crystalline mush <laughs> is what we call it um, so it's magma that's partially cooled but not completely solidified and so it's all about tipping those t those temperatures enough that you can turn more of that material into liquid melt and it's a good analogy here's your honey container right if you've got honey that's mostly crystallized versus um uh if it's fully runny you know honey at different temperatures that's a good analogy here so yes absolutely it's easier to remelt magma that that has cooled partially from a previous eruption but if it's completely cooled and solidified and it's basically rock then i would say the answer is no but if it's just partially cooled then yes um Okay, uh, Elaine, my friend Elaine in Tucson wants to know plans for the next set of random road cuts and short geology videos. I lo love what you've done so far. Oh yeah, so I didn't share um, that part of what I wanted to do today. And so some other things coming down the pipe that you might see for me, I'll keep doing Iceland updates. I know a lot of my European viewers like those. And certainly if I'll do those whenever I feel like there's, there's information that can be passed along, something new. Uh, obviously, if an eruption takes place, I'll, I'll try to be be there for you as much as I can. Um, but the main thing I do is put out these field based videos where I go somewhere and I see an interesting geologic landscape or scenario or outcrop and I, I explain it and show it as best I can. And so I, I finished up a trip in Southern California in early December. So I've got some more of those videos coming around Christmas time. Our family went to Southwestern Utah. So I've got a couple more of those as well. Um, I did do, so there's one more random road cut Elaine in the hopper from Southwestern Utah near St. George. Uh, and then I'm out. So I'll need to get out and do some more of those um what else do i have i've got some still from south dakota i've got one from the from badlands national park i haven't put out i have one from mount rushmore that just needs some like editing um that i want to do i've got a couple from wyoming uh, and then as we get into spring and things start turning a little nicer around here i'll get out and do some more as well so thanks for asking about that um bart wants to know what does groundwater have an effect on the magma and can steam forming result in an explosion well you need to get it's all about proportions if you just have a little bit of groundwater and a huge amount of magma then the groundwater doesn't make any difference um, but if you can get the right proportions right and you would need it probably at, at shallower levels so um, you need lava and water interacting probably within a kilometer or so of the surface or right at the surface, if it's surface water instead of groundwater, uh, then you can potentially create explosive conditions. But you've got to have a substantial amount of groundwater. So with groundwater, groundwater typically moves very slowly. And so as groundwater is maybe seeping into, let's say, a vertical dike, um, a lot of times the heat from the dike sort of seals off, you know, as it cools against the wall rock, that forms an effective seal to the groundwater infiltrating it and trying to mix with it and so a lot of times even though because there's groundwater pretty much everywhere so a lot of times we don't see that lava water interaction so to get something explosive you would need a lot of water so if you have an eruption in a lake or the ocean that can be explosive but for groundwater you've got to have a highly porous and permeable groundwater system um and maybe a little less lava than or magma than you might otherwise and then you can get more explosive uh, results and conditions so thank you for your question um janet wants to know if there's any places available for my iceland trip in may uh not right now i think that's full but i'll probably do another one the next year um could the ra wants to know could the compacting by the workers cause the section to break off with him on it i guess they're talking she they're talking about the uh the crack in Grindavik. Um, I don't know enough about it to know. I think it was just an accident and the, the, it was unstable. I don't know if he lost his footing. 
who knows um let's see mr muppet fan could you explain explain the difference between harmonic and tectonic tremor and background noise so this has to do with seismic waves uh, and i am not a great geophysicist or seismologist um, but i'll explain it as best i can and hopefully this helps um, so when when rocks break that produces an earthquake right so we can get stress building up and then and then the rocks break and they shift and they move and that energy propagates out and creates an earthquake and that would create a, a, a seismic signal and what you would see is a big you know up and down blip on the seismogram that would be a tectonic earthquake um, caused by stress and fault and uh, faults faulting harmonic tremor is magma moving it's magma moving but not it's not magma breaking rock if magma is breaking rock then that will look more like a tectonic quake but if the magma is just moving through a pathway um it creates a i think it's low frequency um so it just kind of oscillates it doesn't have a big blip on the seismogram it's just like this continuous up and down motion because remember magma is not completely liquid rock it has some solids to it as well and as it moves internally in the subsurface through some pathway um, it does create some seismic energy that can be picked up as harmonic uh, tremor and then background noise would just be when the magma is not moving and there's no tectonic quakes happening and the earth's just sort of doing its thing that would be kind of like background noise just you know just the earth just doing its thing i suppose is the best way to put it um good seismologists and maybe even not so good seismologists can just dis can distinguish between all three of those they can even distinguish between a rock fall event construction work an explosion at a mine um, you can look at the waveforms and analyze it to some in some detail and you can tell one event from another by looking at those so um i hope hopefully that helps a little bit um blade how does the mantle generate the magnetic field since it's solid similar to Ruth's question um again probably a little bit outside my scope but the idea there is that the convection of iron so the outer core has a lot of iron and nickel and by allowing that to move and convect and circulate that generates a magnetic field and i don't i'm not a physicist i don't know enough about that to explain that in in probably good detail um yeah um could i make a video about the biggest volcanoes in iceland like Astra, katla hekla oh boy i probably not anytime soon <laughs> so um, my bandwidth is I'm, I'm pretty much at maximum capacity right now um i was wondering if this is from Krog krogoroth I was wondering if geyser eruptions in Yellowstone have the ability to trigger magma eruptions. I've heard several people say that it's scientifically sound. Um, I've never heard of that. The geyser eruptions, again, that's the, the hydrothermal, the, 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 it's the water system. So a geyser eruption triggering a magma eruption, I've never heard of that correlation going that way. You potentially could have magma activity that changes the shallow groundwater conditions and causes geysers to become more frequent or less frequent or more explosive or less explosive so it works the other way but i don't think it works the way you explained there at least to my knowledge um let's see here uh grandpa and grandma just keep going i love that that's a great little handle is the blue lagoon like the geysers in yellowstone the blue lagoon to my knowledge is um and i'll let Amanda Joe or someone else jump in here if they want to so the power plant it has wells boreholes in the area that are pumping out hot groundwater which is heated because this is a volcanically and tectonically active part of Iceland um, they run that hot water usually through like a binary system where they heat up another liquid to turn a turbine and, and the, the the gas generates the electricity um, but the the hot water effluent so basically the wastewater from their power generating activities um, is piped over here into this old lava field and because it's uh, somewhat high in silica and it's this pretty blue color it's become the number one attraction in iceland and so i don't want to diminish it it's still pretty cool and it's hot water and who doesn't love soaking in pretty hot water outside um, but that's what the 
the blue lagoon is it's it's wastewater if you will but that sounds bad it's it's effluent it's leftover water from the power plant operations uh, that are then allowed to sit on the surface and then probably slowly percolate back into the ground so it's not really a geyser field at all um, let's see what else oh someone's telling me you can turn time stamp in the chat on by right clicking it oh boy um, I didn't try that before well it's I'm running it through OBS so I wonder if that is different because I'm doing it a little bit differently so okay um, next question Kadri Lils I read that in Iceland they are drilling a hole to reach magma chamber if it is so what is the reason and what would they want to find okay so I that's actually a nice segue some viewer and I can't remember their name so I apologize but someone sent me um, this article which explains just that and I, I I skimmed it I didn't read it in detail so I'll maybe just put a link to this in the video description but there is plans to <clears throat> drill into magma and basically there's lots of ads in here um, but the part I did read that I remember the work is building on previous efforts at the start of the century to drill close to one of Krafla's magma chambers um, so on that occasion, the intent was only to go near the chamber to explore geothermal energy options. However, the chamber wasn't as deep down as expected, so the magma was much closer to the surface. The project accidentally broke through into the magma, which eventually prevented any further attempts to drill as the overwhelming heat destroyed the well. However, it did confirm that drilling into a magma chamber does not cause the volcano to erupt. And, and that might be, for me, that was like almost the golden takeaway right there because I've had so many folks either through secondhand information or whatever say hey just drill a hole into the magma and then let's just let this thing ooze out and that's not the way it works um yeah and so i think they're seeing it as a to answer your question they're seeing this as a cool research opportunity um being able to go into the crust and sample magma would give us huge knowledge uh, we hope to be able to have a direct measurement at least of temperature which has not been done before it says there's a lot of challenges though because they've got to develop the drills and sensors that can withstand the, that kind of environment and temperature uh, but if all goes well drilling will get underway in 2026 so there you go um, pretty cool like what a cool world we live in right awesome um, let's see next question um, blade J are tectonic plates a prerequisite for life uh, I probably will just pass on that one um, I'm not a biologist. Certainly there's a close association between geologic activity early in Earth's history and life, but uh, that's that's probably, that's like a three hour discussion right there. So sorry if I'm punting that one. Um, Wayne, with all these GPS stations giving 3D data, is there not a software program that can visualize the inflation and deflation in 3D plus time? There probably is, and if someone knows and wants to send it to me that I can share with folks, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> I imagine there is, Wayne. I just, I, I don't know. I don't know for sure, and I don't know if someone has that, so... Can you do a future video from Tammy, Tammy Lynn, on the New Madrid earthquakes and their cause? Uh, maybe. I mean, that, that's another cool topic. I actually have a list somewhere. So many lists. Um, lists and lists upon lists. I have a list somewhere. I can't even find it underneath all my other lists of, like, ideas. Like, here's, like, some cool cool videos I think I could do that would people would enjoy. And that new, the New Madrid earthquakes would be one. Um Let's see, I'm looking for mostly all caps here or my name. I think, yeah, someone talking about the red zone and Grudendevik. People telling me about the timestamps. I'll look into that. It was just a little thought there. Um, Brian is going to go cook dinner here in Scotland. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for letting me know. Hope it's a good one. Uh, Rocky outcrop is the northeast of Ireland and Scotland the same basalt produced at the same time, or is that a leading question? Um, yeah, my European geology is somewhat limited. 
but there are parts of the UK, um, Ireland, this region here, Scotland, that have, and Greenland, the hotspot that formed Iceland formed, oh, what is it, like 60 million years ago? Oh, I don't know if that's the right number, but, um, and there are pieces of those basalts from when the hotspot was initiated that are both in Eastern Greenland and in parts of uh, the UK over here, the British Isles. So, um, yeah, so very likely, I'd have to look into that in a little bit more detail. Um, let's see. Oh, you're welcome, Heidi. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Rap, are you considering organizing a field trip to Yellowstone area? Yeah, there's actually, well, yes, but, but not imminently. There's um, one idea that has been thrown at me, and it's a pretty good one, and so I'd love to follow up on it, would be a field trip, um, get rid of the roads there, a field trip chasing the Yellowstone hotspot. So starting in southwestern Idaho, more or less, um, I mean, if you really want to trace the hotspot, you need to go to the coast of Oregon. But, you know, tracing the hotspot from some area, maybe we would start in Twin Falls, I don't know. But starting somewhere and then hitting different places and sites along the way, maybe Craters of the Moon. There's some really cool things around Idaho Falls over here uh, and then ending the trip around Yellowstone. So that's that is an idea I have. It's just about putting it into play. So, yeah, thanks for thanks for showing interest in that. Yeah, Kate, is the partially crystallized magma a bit like a slushy drink in consistency? Yeah, I think that's, you know, like the ice is the solid and your your drink is the liquid. And that's the idea. In a magma chamber, the crystals are the solid and the melt, the molten rock, is the liquid. And so absolutely. The only other thing that you have that's a little different, <clears throat> and maybe it works for drink, depending on what you're drinking, is gases, right? You also have gases as well. So if your slushy drink is a... Um, coca-cola then that's not a bad analogy the difference is your your slushy drink in if it's soda or coca-cola is very runny it's not very viscous and sticky and thick and the magma chamber is much thicker um marcia says there seems to be a swarm of earthquakes now so let's see what's happening um what's happened over the last two hours oh well not much where am i am i missing something here where's the swarm of earthquakes last four hours do I need to refresh? Does that help? Not really. Yeah, sorry, Marsha. I'm not seeing it. Maybe I missed something. Um, Sunny wants a video on Mima Mounds um, in in Washington. Probably won't do one of those. Just there's so many things. I mean, I, there's just so much to tackle. Um, salt columns of Northeast Ireland are exactly the same age as Iceland. Yes. That's I, I've heard that. I just I need to dig into that a little bit more. Um, Carrie, chemistry of water and magma in different depths. Huge pressure in magma change chemistry to what? Uh, I don't quite get all that, Carrie or Kari. Uh, let's see. And, you know, everyone wants me to, like, go to their, quote, unquote, neck of the woods and, and do a video. And I would love to, but it's, you know time energy money all those things what causes the increase of magma influx whoops i lost it into a magma chamber one time over another well randy good question it has to do with you know how is is the supply of magma fed into these shallower sills is it, is it a constant influx or is it surge like i think that when you look at the gps stations at least here in iceland the ones we've been monitoring you see such a steady, for the most part, steady increase that it seems like the supply is is fairly steady. Um, and that's being fed by a deeper source. So, yeah. Uh, can you make a video, video from Germany's super volcano? If I ever am Germany, that would be awesome. And that was from Yviv, Spirit of Stitching and More. Um... Thomas Ray, I'm in agreement with you about having Blue Lagoon open is increasingly dangerous until this next direction happens. I can see lawyers standing by to bring lawsuits for PTSD injuries. It's a sticky wicket and every culture and country is a little bit different. I'm certainly not going to pass judgment. I really do see it both ways. Like if if I'm feeding my family off people coming to my little hot spring to soak and you're telling me I can't do that, um, it's hard, right? It's, it's hard to deal with. So, 
Um, but at the same time, you've got one road into this facility. You have a more or less a ticking time bomb, for lack of a better term. You know, and, you, and protecting public safety is part of your job and your role as a public official. So I, I see that just as well also. Blade J wants to know, what are your favorite educational YouTube channels? Um, who do I, I don't, I, I don't watch a lot of YouTube channels, so I'm so busy. I do, so I, I watch Nick Zentner. A lot of you are fans of his, but I don't watch, all, I, he does so many, I can't keep up, and I don't know the geology of that part of the world that well. Um, so I'd say I'm, I'm not as dedicated as a lot of you are. I watch um, the Just Icelandic guy. I watch his stuff because he has some interesting things. Um, and that's about it. My wife's a uh, school counselor, a social worker, and she's put together a little channel. So I'll go onto hers and like hers, so she gets more, so she gets more notoriety or whatever. But that's about it. Hers is called Building Better Behavior. So if you have kids, or you work in a school system, or you want to deal with kids and behaviors, you can go look at hers and and see if you like that. Um, cool. Let's see, we'll do a couple more here. I appreciate those that have stayed on this long. This is great. Uh, and everything I'm seeing so far in the chats, we've got just really good conversations going on. Um, productive, respectful, so I appreciate that. Any comments? Oh, maybe that's for everyone. To, on decision today to evacuate Gudindavik again. Yeah, it's tough. I don't know. Um, Ron says, so drilling into a magma chamber is not the geologic, geologic equivalent of popping a zit. No, it is not. It does not relieve the pressure. All the juices don't come flying out. Sorry if that's too graphic, but yeah, that doesn't work that way. Uh, our core samples, this is from Gordon BG, our core samples used to determine composition of deep rock. Um, we Yeah, sure, if we can drill, anytime we drill down and get core samples, that tells us about the subsurface to my knowledge they they've drilled probably uh for the power plant oh i'm on the wrong thing now that's okay um but i don't know if they've done a lot of like just research borehole geochemistry to look at the exact it'd be interesting though to look at the boreholes for the power plant which probably don't go down that far though um it'd be neat to see what the rock is like in this area and that would maybe give us a better sense of how it might behave as this magma is trying to move through it so good question um, do all geothermal power plants inject oh whoops i just lost it inject explosive chemistry to maintain above 100 c um i don't think anything's explosive so i'm, I'm not sure i don't know a lot about geothermal power plants from starman what is your personal specialization as geologist so i'm trained as a structural geologist so faults folds tectonics um, but the area i did research in, in in baja mexico had a lot of volcanic rocks so i've learned a lot about volcanic rocks uh, volcanoclastic rocks it was a complicated area because the layers didn't match up they were they changed laterally so like you might have a sandstone but then it graded into something else and then uh, you know, you think of like a real complicated volcanic setting, like a like Japan or something like that. That was kind of the the analog we had. So those are probably my expertise. But I but as a geologic educator, I'm kind of interested in everything. So I'm probably you know a, a mile or kilometer wide and an inch or centimeter deep in some instances. But in some some instances I do know a lot and I probably have more specialized more in areas. So Western United States, not everywhere, of course, but uh, the Colorado Plateau region, Basin and Range, the Snake River Plain, obviously, where I live, Grand Canyon region. Uh, I know a lot about Hawaii because I've spent a lot of time there. So those are some of my areas of, of expertise. But I'm always trying to learn. There's obviously always people that know more than you. Um, and I think asking questions and learning is the way to way to tackle things. Um, let's see, is the horizontal movement in November a Graben and a Moho at the same time from Renate? So the Moho is the boundary between the crust and the mantle. Um, yeah, horizontal move. I'm not sure I understand that question, sorry. Let's see, 
from Cato. Is there any scenario of volcanic activity on Iceland that you're aware of that could trigger an Atlantic tsunami? That's a fun question. Um, no, I don't think. Well, I think you're referring to like a basin wide tsunami. So something that spans across the ocean and you would need to displace a lot of water. So while we could get we could get an underwater volcanic eruption like we had with Surtsey, um it still wasn't big enough to trigger a, a large basin-wide tsunami. You'd probably need a big earthquake. If you get a big up and down earthquake on the plate boundary, either south of Iceland or north of Iceland, you could probably generate a tsunami there. But it's not as likely to be as big as some of these past ones. So remember that subduction zones produce the big earthquakes, magnitude 9 earthquakes like we saw with Indonesia in 2004, Japan in 2011. These divergent plate boundaries like in Iceland, 7 to maybe 7.5 is pretty much the upper limit in terms of earthquake magnitudes. And that's just not enough displacement, just not enough movement uh, to cause a really large destructive tsunami. So probably not a very big one. Um, depressed optimist any thoughts on Italy's Campi Flegre um, I haven't followed that I've seen a little bit of it in the news those bigger though caldera type systems they they sort of inflate and deflate over time little swarms of earthquakes here and there but they're such big systems that having a truly explosive eruption like Yellowstone can take um, a long time it can take you know thousands of years so am I worried about it erupting in a major way anytime soon nope not at all um let's see the groundwater in the cracks in Grindavik are below sea level the water is murky but becomes less murky when ocean is flooding more murky when sea level is low why let me read that again groundwater is below sea level the water is murky, but becomes less murky. When the ocean is flooding, do you mean at high tide? Um, yeah, not sure. I'd need to look into that in a little bit more detail. Uh, let's see. Enjoyed from Stephen Glasser. Enjoyed your Southern Utah videos. Just visited. Did you visit the Parowind Gap petroglyphs? No. I know where they are. I just haven't been out there before. Um, you know, squeezing these little videos into like a family vacation like you, you pick and choose your time it's not like i had four or five days of just all day to go do it we were we were doing other things together so uh, geology seems similar to others you mentioned but the exposed rock face is small can you explain i'd have to go look at it um that's west of cedar city um there's some i think there's some tufts out there some conglomerates i'd have to go look it's a good place to go check out though Oh, thanks for your donation, Roxy. Very kind. Appreciate it. Um, Tamara, they were able to virtually map the Yellowstone magma chambers using earthquakes. Can they do this in Iceland? They should be able to. It, it's it's sort of a resource money thing. Um, I'm sure it's been done. The difference, too, in Iceland is w which magma chamber? You've got, you know two dozen or more volcanoes um and the ones you know even though this one seems to be the one we're focusing on over here um these ones over here in the central part of the country are the ones that have historically been uh, the most um impactful i suppose Th this place has been sleeping for what 800 years a thousand years and it's just now waking up so we're just starting to figure out like whoa like we, this is a new a new situation here a uh, couple more questions. What time is it? Let's see. We'll go for 10 more minutes if you guys want to. Starman, do you know any cool places to go near SF? San Francisco? Pinnacles National Park? Um, Muir, Muir Woods is a cool place. Not much geology, but... Magnitude map. This is from Noreen Martin. Shows MLW and am what's the difference okay so yeah if you're watching the earthquakes on here there's the list on the right so you get the time the magnitude depth and alert areas just sort of like the region that it's in 
And so the magnitude, there's an AM for some of the earthquakes and there's an MLW for some of the earthquakes. So the AM means that it was auto automatically measured. Basically, the computer detected the earthquake, assessed a preliminary magnitude to that quake, and then spit it right into this feed. So the computer saying, hey, I, I've detected an earthquake. Here's how big it's believed to be or estimated to be. Here you go. Here's all the data. MLW means it's actually been checked or confirmed. So a seismologist has looked at the data and said, yes, this was an earthquake. Yes, this magnitude is correct or it gets amended. Um, so yeah, good question there as you're looking at those earthquake feeds coming through. Dan, um, do you think the lava cooling effort in Heime did any good or were they just lucky? So he's referring to in 1973, there was the eruption on the Isle of Heime here. Um, you can see the volcano there still. You can see the lava that kind of poured out, impacted a lot of homes. And I think at one point, I know some Icelandic folks are on here and they'll they'll correct all the mistakes I make. So I apologize if I, if I misspeak here. But at one point, they were worried that the lava coming down to the coastline here would threaten their harbor, which is really like their livelihood there. That if, you know, you, you closed off this harbor, then then it's kind of gone. And so they started fighting that eruption by spraying seawater onto the lava field. Um, did it do any good? Maybe a little bit, like a tiny bit. Um, it, it, I think maybe there's something to be said for just the human psyche of like, we're doing something, we're being proactive. Um, but the way I understand it, someone I'm sure will correct me, like the eruption, I think it started to wind down about then. So I'd need to I'd need to go back and check all the details. So I don't want to I don't want to misspeak. So but clearly we've learned that that's not a 100 percent effective way to stop lava. Right. Is by putting water on it. Does it help? Sure. A little bit. But a you need a ton of water. Um, yeah, it's, it's really kind of a, a volume thing. If you could somehow get enough water on it all at once, it, it might be more effective, but it's just not, usually not an effective way to do it. Um, let's see, a couple more questions. Oh, I think I've caught up. Maybe, maybe we're good there. I think I've caught up. If you have any last minute questions I haven't asked, uh, maybe throw those up now. Um, otherwise, we'll kind of wind this down. And then I'm excited to read through all your comments later once I get this kind of buttoned up and done. So sweet. Well, we had a lot of people on here. That was great. That might be, I don't know, I've never really counted, but that's that's a lot for my live streams. Kotla is steaming. Is that something to worry about? Um, not yet, Sarah. Like we need to see the earthquakes. We need to see some other data uh, to worry about that. Yeah, so I'm not too concerned about that just yet. Let's see. Yeah, how can effects of uplift on a magma chamber be monitored or can it? Um, well, we can, the GPS works. There's also tilt meters that work that are very precise. They can measure like a, a tiny, tiny amount of just tilt of a slope. Um, yeah, so that's a couple ways that we, we measure uplift. Mr. Svetti, how to contact you about your trips. Um, if you're just wanting to know when the trips are coming and just, just keep watching the channel, I'll make sure I do announcements. Um, I will let you know this particular one in April. If you know you're interested, you can email me at that email address. I gave you that Gmail address at the beginning. Um, and that would be the way to, to, to know and find out. Um, I'm kind of baby stepping my way into these trips. So I started with just some local ones last year. This year I'm doing those again, but I'm also taking uh, some folks to Iceland. So doing like a bigger abroad, you know, multi-day trip. And then next year I'll add the, the Grand Canyon trip and a couple more. So a lot of these, you know, realize that I, I, I teach here at the college. So a lot of these trips will have to be summer, my summer uh, time or like weekend close regional ones on the weekend so until at least for now so um are there any other eruptions in iceland 
threatening an eruption. Well, Grimsvoten is the one they think, you know, that's the one. They actually, have, its alert level has gone back and forth from green to yellow. So this, this volcano here, potentially. But, but there's a lot of volcanoes in Iceland. So we'll have to see how it all goes. Uh, does rain affect volcanic eruptions? Not really. Just cools it off a little bit quicker, but no. The it, you could have a torrential, you could have a torrential downpour over an actively erupting volcano. Remember too, there's those drops of water, if they're falling down over like you know like the, the kind of vent we saw on December 18th, it's so much heat is coming up from that that those raindrops aren't even most of the time making all their way to the ground. They're completely evaporating due to all the heat coming from the eruption site. So, um, oh, Mark has asked a couple of times, sorry, Mark, Mark Simons, what entry level courses would you suggest for someone looking to further knowledge in the field of geology and volcanology? So I always think the best gateway class, if you have a college or university nearby and you have the ability to sign up for um, classes, I would do physical geology. Physical geology teaches you what the earth is made of so it'll give you a good solid foundation in rocks and minerals and then it also teaches how the earth works so it teaches processes and to me that's my favorite class i teach that's the one i think you know if you can if you can do well in that class and and learn that content then you're ready to go uh the next step and maybe specialize in volcanoes or or do something more uh, specific uh tim pointing wants someone to start a GoFundMe to raise funds to take me to Iceland. Heck yeah, I'm all for that. I would, or not Iceland, New Zealand. I would love to go to New Zealand. That's very high on my list. So, um, but in order for me to lead a field trip, realize I need to go there first and kind of like suss it out. And that's kind of what happened in Iceland. I went there in 2015 with my wife. Uh, then I took students in 2018. And then by the time I went there in 2022, when it was erupting, like I had a good lay of the land. I kind of knew where things were. I'd figured out some really cool field trip stops. So, um, okay, I think I'm going to wind down and let you folks get back to your Saturday or maybe it's Sunday where you are. Um, yeah, thanks for all the kind words, friends. I really appreciate it. Um, I just love what I do, and I hope that comes across. I love teaching. I love sharing. I don't have all the answers, but I love learning. Um, I convey that, I think, pretty effectively to my students, and you guys are just an extension of that. It's been so great these last, I guess, two or three years, finding an outlet beyond just the college classroom to share geology with folks and to meet so many people with so many great um, backgrounds and interests. I've learned so much from you and so when i address you as team i really i really believe that we're we're a we're a geology learning team all of us together and um i might be a bit of the glue guy that keeps us all together and that's fine um but i, I love just learning and 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 sharing with people as, as best i can so I'll go ahead and let you guys go for now. Look for some more Iceland updates in the next week or so. There'll be some other videos coming your way as well. And maybe in a couple weeks, we'll do another live stream. So take care. Have a great day and be well. Thanks.